Hello, everyone. Welcome. We will get started here. It is now three o'clock central time. So let's get going. My name is Jennifer Bonner. I'm the lead tutor with Archer Review. I'm so delighted that you're joining me um, this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever, uh, whatever time it is where you are. I'm just excited that you're here. So welcome. This is our free webinar Wednesday. Today, we're going to be talking all things maternity. So let's get going. We're going to work through a case study together today. But first, what I would like to know is, where are you joining me from? So if you are unfamiliar with Slido, we'll be using this throughout the day, um, throughout our time together. If you can scan the QR code with your smartphone, it'll take you directly to the site, or if you want to join me at slido.com, um, the code is maternity with Archer. Honolulu, Houston, Texas, Georgia, Canada, lots of Texas. Toronto, Rochester, Illinois, Puerto Rico, Nepal. Awesome. Georgia, Vancouver, New Jersey. Arizona, North Carolina. Wonderful. We have people from all over. That's awesome. Massachusetts. Washington, Tampa, United Kingdom. Awesome. Well, I am just absolutely thrilled that you're here. We are going to go ahead and dive right in. So let's meet our first client, shall we? So Mrs. Jones is a 31-year-old female. She calls her OB provider and states she thinks she is pregnant. Oh, my word. She has had a positive pregnancy test. She's really tired, and she's lacking energy. Hmm. There's a couple things there that right off the bat, we have some information, right? So tell me, what sign of pregnancy is a positive pregnancy test? And we'll talk about all this, but I want to see where are you at? I'm seeing some presumptive, seeing pr some probable. So what sign of pregnancy? So we have our three different categories. I want to know what sign of pregnancy is the positive pregnancy test. I'm seeing probable, presumptive. I'm seeing some positive, okay. So we have a little bit of everything. Okay, well, let's break this down just a little bit, shall we? So we have our different categories that we list different symptoms in that tell us signs of pregnancy. So the first one we're gonna talk about is our presumptive. Okay, our presumptive signs of pregnancy. So when I think of presumptive, I want you to think of the word presume, okay? So that's your period is absent. You're really tired, enlarged breasts, um, sore breasts, urination frequency, movement perceived. You're starting to maybe feel a little bit of baby movement in there, emesis and nausea. Now, if you'll notice with these different signs and symptoms, they can be related to other options besides pregnancy, right? So an absent period, amenorrhea, that could be because a woman is pregnant, but it could also be due to other things. It could be due to severe stress. It could be due to malnutrition. It could be due to something like polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that the woman is pregnant, that she is missing her period. Okay. It certainly could be, which why, which is why it puts us in the presumptive category. Now, what about really tired? There's lots of things that can cause us to be really, really tired, right? 
being in nursing school, anybody there that can make you feel really, really tired. You're not getting enough sleep, having other things going on. Uh, maybe you have a lot of stress in your life. Those things can cause you to be really, really tired. What about urination frequency? What kind of things could cause urination frequency? What do you think? You can either think it in your head, you can put it in the chat for me if you'd like. What kind of things can cause urinary frequency? Yes, yes, diabetes, okay, UTIs, yes, they are very common to call you urina urination frequency. Absolutely, certain medications, yes, very, very good. So the thing I want you to know about presumptive signs of pregnancy is that they can be related to other issues besides pregnancy. Okay, so let's look at our next one. Our next one is probable. When I think probable, I think chances are you are probably pregnant, okay? So we have things like positive pregnancy test. Wait a minute, we've seen that before. Return of fetus when tap, we call that ballotment. So chances are when you get a positive pregnancy test, there are just a few things that could cause that to be off, but chances are if you're positive pregnancy test, you are probably pregnant, okay? Very good. So we are starting to feel the outline of a fetus. So when we touch the belly, you can feel that there's a baby in there or there's something in there. Now, chances are it's probably a baby, but there is the off chance that maybe it's something else. Braxton Hicks contractions, those practice contractions, getting the body ready for labor. Softening of the cervix. We call this Goodall sign. So that's where the, the cervix gets nice and soft, ready to um, do its job later on. There's also come something called Chadwick's sign. Okay, Chadwick sign. Chadwick sign is where the cervix gets kind of a bluish color. And I think B, C. So blue color, Chadwick sign. So B for blue. C for Chadwick's, those go together. And then lower uterine segment um, softens, we call that Hagar sign. So when you think of the uterus, I want you to think of it as kind of an upside down pair, okay? Kind of bigger at the top, kind of funneling down. That bottom portion, that lower uterine segment will start to soften. We call that Hagar sign. And then the uterus getting larger. Someone is asking, where can we get a copy of this recording? It will be available to you on Facebook. We are streaming live there for you. Great question. Okay, so our last group is our positive signs of pregnancy. When you think of positive signs of pregnancy, I want you to think of the word fetus. So fetal movement is felt by the healthcare provider. Electronic device. So our electronic device is starting to detect those fetal heart sounds. There's a delivery of a baby. If a baby comes out, a baby is delivered. They were positively pregnant. There is no doubt about it. There's an ultrasound that detects a fetus. And then we're starting to see those movements by the fetus. Now, when you think about these, they're a little bit different than all of the other signs and symptoms that we had just talked about, right? So fetal movement that's felt by a healthcare provider. You have movement that's seen by a healthcare provider. We have ultrasound that's generally done by a healthcare provider. Delivery of a fetus. Now, there are people who have home births, things like that. But for the most part, these are things that you're going to need help with. You're going to need a provider there. So electronic device, generally there's a provider, there's a nurse, someone attaching those for you. So those are our large categories of signs and symptoms and how we categorize them. All right. So the nurse asks Mrs. Jones, when was her last menstrual period? And she states it was 10, 25, 22. Okay, we need to do something with this information. What do we use to calculate the expected due date? What do you think? What do we use to calculate expected due date? Excellent. Yes. Yes, Nagel's rule. We're going to use Nagel's rule to calculate our due date. 
Excellent job. And someone's already listing it out for me. So if you're not familiar with Nagel's rule, let's talk about that for just a minute. So this is one of my very favorite ways to write out what is going on. What do I need to do? So a lot of times when I was in nursing school, I would list this out so I didn't miss a step at all. So what I want to do first is I want to take that first day of the last menstrual period. Okay. So we know it was 10, 25, 22. We're going to add seven days. We're going to subtract three months and we're going to add a year. And that's going to give us our estimated due date. Now, think about it. Is there a time when we would not want to adjust the year? Can you think of a time where we would not want to adjust the year, even though it's listed? Let me know. Not necessarily in a leap year. So what if her last menstrual period was in January? Yes, if nine months later is still in the same year. Excellent, Nikia, absolutely. Yes, so if our last menstrual period was in January, February. So if their due date is still going to be in the same year, we're not going to adjust that year. Excellent job. Okay, so our last menstrual period was 10, 25, 22. So what's this gonna look like? How do we even start to work this out? Well, this is how I like to do it. So I like to think of my steps and then I'm just gonna list it out from there because it helps me not make sure that one, I'm not missing a step and two, I can visually see what I've already done. So the first thing that we need to do is add seven days. So. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, because there are 31 days in October and we get to November 1st, November 1st, 2022. Now, some people have a hard time remembering how many days are in each month. Now, this is how I like to remember 30 days have September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except February that has 28. Okay, I'll say that one more time. 30 days have September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except for February that has 28. So we've added our seven days. We got to November 1st, 2022. Now we have to go backwards. We got to subtract our three months. So we go October. So what comes before October? September. So we get back to August 1st, and then we're going to add a year. So 8-1-2023 is our due date. Now, remember, if her um, last menstrual period would have been in January of 2022, we would not be adjusting the, um, the year there. All right, so let's talk about some weekly developmental milestones in pregnancy. We know that throughout the pregnancy, there are different things occurring in each trimester, right? There's a lot of things that are going on, especially in that first trimester um, that we need to talk about. So we've determined that Mrs. Jones is 11 weeks gestation. She's 11 weeks along. So what developmental milestones have occurred by this point? So we're still in that first trimester. So what different things have, what are going on? What kinds of things are going on in the life of this fetus? Okay, we have a heartbeat. Seeing spinal cord. Can't pay, palpate the fundus yet, very good. I'm seeing heartbeat. I'm seeing morning sickness. So we're talking about developmental milestones. So we're talking about the fetus, the baby, neurotubes, extremities, organs. Quickening does not occur just yet. So quickening are those first fetal movements that mom is feeling. And that's generally closer to that 20 week mark. Organs, heart speeding. Yes. Excellent job. 
You are getting it. So it's a good idea to know what is going on at various stages of the pregnancy. Now, I'd like to take a moment to just talk about small group tutoring. If you're struggling with certain concepts, maybe it's maternity, maybe it's labor and delivery, things like that. We have small group tutoring offerings that are available for various different concepts. You can scan the QR code here that will take you to a link that shows what our options are. These are $25 for an hour session by one of our expert tutors. So we focus on practice questions, the key information of those high yield topics. So if you're someone that you still have, maybe there's a certain subject that you're struggling in, or maybe there's a certain concept, maybe you are just wanting to see, hey, what does an NCLEX look like? We do have mock NCLEXs that we offer in a small group format. Go ahead and scan the code here and that will take you right to our offerings of what is available. All right, so let's go back. Let's talk about those developmental milestones. We're gonna talk first about the first trimester. So we know the first trimester is those first 13 weeks, right? So in our first month, we have that fertilized egg, it's going to grow. We have a sac that's forming around it that's going to create the amniotic sac. We have developing placenta. And then those heart, that heart tube develops. Now we move into our second month. And so for our purposes, a month is considered four weeks. So that fetus is continuing to develop. To develop. We have the neuro tube that's well formed. Okay, so we talk about, um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but folic acid, this is why it's really important for women to be taking this before they find out they're pregnant, because within this second month, that neurotube is well formed. And then a heartbeat can be detected via ultrasound by about six weeks. Now, our third month, so we have weeks nine to 12. After that eight, eight week, we start referring to the baby as a fetus. It's no longer an embryo. Okay, we have hands, arms, fingers, feet, toes, all these are fully developed and they start to open and close their fist, open and close their mouth. And by the end of the third month, we have a fully formed fetus with all the organs, all the limbs, everything is there. And they're going to continue to develop in order for those things to become functional. So you notice there at the bottom, because all of this development has taken place by the end of the third month, it's all there, it's just continuing to be refined, the risk of miscarriage goes down significantly. So this is where women, when they reach that second trimester, they get to the end of the first trimester, they're jumping into the second, they tend to feel a little bit better because that risk decreases significantly. Okay, so another really important thing that I need you to understand is GTPAL. So this is one of the things that we will do right off the bat when a woman comes into the clinic. She's going, we need to calculate her GTPAL. Okay, so along with this pregnancy, she's had a history of a healthy delivery at 38 weeks, emergency C-section at 29 weeks, but the child did not survive. Now, let's jump back into Slido. Tell me, what is Mrs. Jones' GTPAL? What do you think? And we will go through this. So if this is a sticky concept for you, please do not be concerned. We will go through this here in just a few minutes. But take, take a guess. Try, to, try your best. Give me a guess. What do you think? GTPAL. And if you need to just do it one at a time, that is totally fine. If you need to do the G's first, the P's, that's fine. I'm seeing some G2s, I'm seeing some G3s. So the question is, what is Mrs. Jones' GTPAL? Okay, so she's currently pregnant. She has a history of a healthy delivery at 38 weeks and an emergency C-section at 29 weeks where her child did not survive. I'm seeing a lot of great answers coming through. Many of you are getting this concept, which is great because this is one of those big ones that I need you to understand. Excellent job. I'm seeing some G2s, seeing some G3s. We're going back and forth in between those. We'll talk about that here in just a minute.
All right. So let's talk about this. So she said that she um, has, so we know that she's currently pregnant. This is one of the first things that can stump us up is if we forget that she's currently pregnant and the current pregnancy is going to count in her G. Okay. So that's her gravita. So she's currently pregnant. She had a history of a healthy delivery and a C-section. So we have a G3. Okay. So what about her term? How many term pregnancies did she have? Well, just the one. So G3, T2, preterm. We'll talk about this in a minute, but preterm is anything that's after 20 weeks, but before. 437. So it could be up to 36 weeks and six days, and it is still considered preterm. So she had one of those at the, her 29 week um, C section. Abortions. Now, abortions are considered any pregnancy that is lost before 20 weeks, and we don't have any indication that she had one of those. Now, living is current living children. And so because the 29 weeker did not survive and she's currently pregnant, that baby has not been born yet. She's an L1. So let's break this down a little bit further. What is a G? Well, G stands for gravidity, gravidity. So that's the number of pregnancies that she's had. And remember, that is also going to count this current pregnancy. That's one that um, sometimes will mix me up just a little bit, but it does count the current pregnancy. When we're talking about G specifically, that gravidity, twins count as one pregnancy. They are two babies, two fetuses, but it is one pregnancy. Now, term. T is for term. We know that term is 37 weeks, okay? If I said 36 weeks and six days, that's not term because we have not reached 37 weeks yet. So term has to be 37 weeks gestation. So we're wanting to know how many pregnancies were carried to term. So I had to get to 37 weeks or beyond. Okay. And here twins are only going to count as once. Someone is saying they can't join Slido. That is totally fine. Go ahead and put your answers in the chat or questions that you have. No worries. Preterm. Now we touched on this just a minute ago, but preterm means before term. We know that term is 37 weeks. Okay. So our preterm births are counted as 20 weeks up to 36 weeks and six days. Okay. So if the baby was 20 weeks and was delivered and passed, it's considered preterm because it was after it was that 20 week or after. Okay. If it was 36 weeks and six days and the baby was born, that's considered pre ter excuse me, preterm. Okay. So 20 weeks to 36 weeks and six days, that is our preterm range. Twins again, only going to count as once here. Okay. They are two babies, but they are counting as once here. Now, abortion, this is where it can get a little bit sticky. So let's spend just a little bit of time here. Now, abortions, this can be a difficult concept to think about. It can be a difficult word to use. But we use abortions as the number of pregnancies that were lost before 20 weeks. Okay, so before 20 weeks. So that's 19 weeks and six days and before. Okay, so we have spontaneous, so that those are we, what we call miscarriages, but there's also terminations. Those can be elective. Um, so I want you to just think about when we are talking about abortions, the A is before 20 weeks, so 19 weeks and six days and before. If it happened, so if baby passed away after 20 weeks, it could be 20 weeks in one day. It's considered in the preterm numbers. It's considered under the P. All right, living children. This one is where our twins are gonna count. Finally, we get to talk about our twins here. So this is current living children. So this is where 
all of the numbers start to make sense. So this is how many children does she currently have alive? And this can change from year to year. So I think about women that I've had in the clinic before that maybe they lost a child in between the time that I've seen them. This L um, number can change from year to year. And this is where our twins are going to count here. So they would count as two. All right, Mrs. Jones states that she's concerned about her nutritional needs now that she is pregnant. So what nutri nutritional needs, what nutritional education should we provide for Mrs. Jones? What do you think? No raw food, okay. She needs some folic acid, okay. We hope that maybe she was taking this before she became pregnant. That would be ideal, right? Limit caffeine. Yeah, so generally we tell women about one coffee a day is fine. We want to be careful with that. Protein. Yes, protein is going to help. Very good. Prenatal vitamin. We absolutely want her taking that prenatal vitamin. Iron food, um, iron rich foods. Absolutely. Vitamin D, calcium, no cat poo. Okay. I hope she wasn't eating that, but that is a good um, educational piece to provide. No alcohol, no smoking. Yes. Folic acid. Okay. So someone is mentioning some things that can be helpful for morning sickness. So maybe having a couple crackers before getting out of bed. Do not try to lose weight during pregnancy. Okay. So we want to be careful with lunch meat. No fish high in mercury. Balanced diet. Yeah. Fruits and veggies. Excellent job. So what I tell women when they come in that first initial appointment, we talk about, remember what you're eating, baby's eating. So if you're eating junk, baby is eating junk food. Okay. So we know that our caloric needs go up as pregnancy progresses. So if a woman starts her pregnancy underweight, she should aim for more like four to 500 calories in addition daily. While an overweight person, we're going to go along that 200 extra calories a day. We certainly, we want to look at those proteins. Proteins are going to help keep mom full, keep her going. It's going to help with fetal growth, but also development of muscle tissue, things like that. Those complex carbs, so our whole grain, starchy vegetables, gives us lasting energy. Okay. We want to be careful with those simple carbs, especially if someone um, has um, gestational or just diabetes in general. Fiber, that, that's really going to help with digestion and constipation and pregnancy, which is common to see. And then healthy fats. So that's, again, going to help with that development of the organs, the placenta, things like that. We want to make sure, and someone touched on this earlier, we want to be careful with those fish that are high in mercury. So things like big eye tuna, mackerel, swordfish, shark, those types of fish are very high in, in mercury. Our oily fish are best. So like fresh tuna, sardines, but we want to limit those portions to about two per week. Okay. So those are really helpful. Um, good in omega threes, which are excellent. Now, what about other things? What other supplements do we need to think about? Well, several of you have already mentioned the use of folic acid. Absolutely. So we prefer again for them to be taking it before they get pregnant. But if this is the first time, hey, go ahead and start taking that folic acid. Typically, this is in a daily prenatal vitamin, helps prevent those birth defects of the spine and the brain. Calcium, this is going to help with bone development, teeth development, important for maternal health during her pregnancy. Vitamin D helps with those fetal bones. Uh, we find that in things like fatty fish, like salmon or fortified milk or orange juice, iron. So this is going to help mom create more blood oxygen carrying capacity for to help with baby's oxygenation. Um, we can find iron in meat, beans. Generally, we want to make sure that that's taken with a vitamin C rich food or even a chewable vitamin C. DHA, so omega-3 fatty acid, helps with eye and brain development. 
Typically, this is in a supplement, but we also find this in our oily fish. Iodine. So this is good for fetal brain um, and nerve growth. So salt is generally now iodized, so it's rarely an issue, um, but mostly we find this in our animal protein. So like beef liver, chicken, fish, um, and even sea veggies like seaweed. Now, we know the things that are good, but what things do we need to be careful with during pregnancy? Well, we've touched on fish that's high in mercury, okay? We want to avoid those. Cold deli meats, lox, hot dogs. We recommend that if mom is going to consume those types of things, that she make sure that it is well cooked, okay? Also, those raw meats and eggs, we want to be very careful with those. Unpasteurized dairy products, pate, liver. So these are high in vitamin A and at high levels, this could actually cause congenital defects in the cardiac and the central nervous system. It can also increase the risk of spontaneous miscarriage. So we wanna be really careful with that. We wanna make sure that any produce that mom's consuming, now remember we talked about fresh fruits and vegetables. Absolutely, we want her to be consuming those, but make sure that those things are washed because they can have um, various things, pesticides, things like that on them. Caffeine. So no more than 200 milligrams a day. Generally, that's about 12 ounces of coffee. So we say one cup of coffee a day, totally fine. More than that can lead to placental umbilical cord vasoconstriction, and that can decrease baby's oxygenation. So we want to be really careful with that. Alcohol at high doses, it can cause fetal alcohol syndrome, and that can cause some um, facial de uh, deformities, growth issues. So we just tell women, just stay away from the alcohol during pregnancy. Now let's take a moment to talk about our private tutoring. This is one of my favorite things about Archer is our private tutors, because it doesn't matter whether you're struggling with test taking anxiety, test taking strategies, maybe maternity is one of your struggles. There are are amazing tutors that we have that are here to help you. Um, Megan, Elizabeth, myself, Kate, Lauren, Emma, Allie, we all love working one-on-one -on -ones with our students. My very favorite thing about working with students one-on-one, -on -one, and that's primarily what I do here at Archer, is those aha moments, those times when, hey, Jennifer, I'm really struggling with this concept. We break it down and the light comes on. All of a sudden, the student that I'm working with, all of a sudden it makes sense. They're like, oh my goodness, this is life changing. So if you have a struggle, if you, and this is completely personalized, whether you need help setting up a study plan or help looking at your CPR report, we are here to help you. You can go ahead and scan the code here. This will take you directly to our site where you can see the availability of our tutors. These are um, scheduled in one hour sessions and they are $75 per hour. But if you schedule at least three, I believe at the same time, you will get a discount and that's available for you on our website. All right, back to Mrs. Jones. So three weeks later, she calls and she says, I can't keep anything down. And she is really having trouble with fluids. So she can't keep anything down, not even fluids. What are we concerned about? What are we concerned about that's going on with Mrs. Jones? And if you're just joining me, you can light on to Slido, log on to slido.com. Our login is maternity with Archer, or you can scan the QR code here. Okay, I'm seeing dehydration. I'm seeing fluid electrolyte imbalance. I'm seeing hyperemesis gravidarium. You are doing amazing electrolytes. Risk for nutrition deficit. Okay, hypokalemia. Eclampsia, okay. We'll talk a little bit more about this here in just a minute. Loss of electrolytes, fluid deficit dehydration, hypovolemia, hyperemesis. You are getting it. You're right. If you said hyperemesis gravidarium, you are correct. We're concerned about hyperemesis gravidarium, but 
what is that? What is hyperemesis gravidarium? Well, this is extreme morning sickness. It's a little bit more than just, uh, my stomach doesn't feel real well right now. This is an extreme morning sickness. It's intense nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. Now, I really like this little chart that we have on the right side of your screen, kind of comparing and contrasting. What's the difference between morning sickness and hyperemesis gravidarium? Because if you're anything like me, when I was in nursing school, I thought these were the same thing. So let's talk about morning sickness for just a minute. So morning sickness, you can have that, that nausea. Um, sometimes it can cause vomiting. Generally, that nausea is going to subside around 20 weeks. A lot of women, that's why they're looking forward to the end of the first trimester because they're like, man, this nausea is going to decrease just a little bit by then. Um, generally, with, uh, with morning sickness, vomiting is not going to cause dehydration. So they may have some vomiting, but it's not intense enough that they're going to be dehydrated. And they're able to keep some food um, down. Maybe not everything, but some of it they should be able to keep down. Now, so you notice that's a little mild on the milder side. Now let's talk about hyperemesis gravidarium. Now we have excessive and persistent vomiting, okay? So remember with morning sickness, it could cause vomiting. With hyperemesis gravidarium, ex excessive persistent vomiting, okay? Generally, this does not subside. Okay, it's kind of a continuous cycle. Severe vomiting can cause lots of different things. Dehydration, weight loss. Many of you said electrolyte imbalance. Absolutely. They cannot keep any food down. And Mrs. Jones is struggling with water too. Now, someone is saying persistence longer than three months. That is absolutely possible. It is also possible for nausea um, to continue past that point. But generally, after that first trimester is when it will subside. Now, we know that a little bit of morning sickness is to be expected with pregnancy, right? But when do we need to get concerned? Well, if they're not able to keep anything down and it's causing weight loss, remember, we don't want to be losing weight during pregnancy. We don't want to be actively trying to lose weight, but we also don't want to be losing weight because we're not getting enough. The other thing we're looking for is dehydration. Now, think back to your assessment. What kind of things are we going to do to figure out hydration status? Well, we're looking at skin turgor. If we pick up their skin and it stays up there, uh-oh, we got some issues. Look at their mucous membranes. Are they pink? Are they moist? Or are they kind of pale and dry? What's the heart rate doing? Looking at our electrolytes, dehydration, we're going to see hypernatremia with that excessive vomiting, hypokalemia, hypochloremia. Those are the common ones that we will see with dehydration. So that's when we get concerned. That's when we want to think about, okay, we need to do something here. But what are we going to do? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about that. Some things that we can try are just some simple dietary modifications. So just sitting up after meals, sometimes laying flat does not go well with our tummies and it can make them upset. So just having them sit up after meals, getting a few crackers before they get out of bed. Someone had mentioned that earlier as an educational piece for Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones, have a couple crackers before you get out of bed. A lot of times that will help with your, um, your sickness there. Small portions. So generally what we will do is we will eat three bigger meals per day, right? We eat a big breakfast, we eat a big lunch, we eat a big dinner. Well, with our women who are struggling with morning sickness and um, hyperemesis gravidarium, we want them to eat small, frequent meals throughout the day. Small portions. We want to make sure they get some protein in there. And we're going to limit those liquids with the meals. We want them to have their liquids in between their meals. That's really going to help. And a lot of times, even a straw can be beneficial because it more so helps be able to re regulate the amount of fluid 
that's in the mouth instead of just taking a big drink of water and all that fluid rushing in. We want to be careful about the spicy. Um, we don't want foods that are too hot or too cold. We're going to keep it very, very simple. Now, when it comes to medications, we want to do a risk assessment, a benefit risk assessment. So the disease, the decision to use any type of medication during pregnancy is going to involve a careful assessment of the potential risks and benefits. Nausea and vomiting during pregnancy are really common and most cases don't require medica medications. The simple lifestyle modifications should be sufficient. But there are times when medication are absolutely necessary. And typically we are going to look at the symptoms, how severe they are, and what is the impact on the pregnant woman's well-being. Now, major medications that we're going to use here is promethazine. This is in a class of medication called antihistamines. It's been used for many, many years to treat nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy, and a relatively long history of use. It's generally considered safe when used appropriately under medical supervision. However, like any other medication, it's not without its potential side effects or risks. So promethazine is the medication I want you to think about when we use for our um, women who need just a little bit more. Now, there are other medications that are available to treat nausea and vomiting during pregnancy, vitamin B6, um, Unisom sometimes, doxalamine, which is an antihistamine. These are medications that we often recommend as our first line treatments because they're the favorable safety profiles. Now, it's really important that we talk about individualized treatment. So the um, client, we're going to have conversations. We're going to talk about the risks, the benefits. What's this look like in your life? How is it altering your day to day? And we are going to come up with a plan together. Some women respond to one medication better than another. So some women may start um one medication and it may work great. Another may start with that medication and we have to move on to something else. All right, so at 28 weeks, Mrs. Jones vomiting is finally under control. Her provider tells her it's time to do a glucose tolerance test. Oh man. Now let's talk about the glucose challenge. So there are two that we want to cover today. The first one is that oral glucose tolerance test. Generally, this is done at 28 weeks. That's what I want you to know. At 28 weeks, mom's going to drink a little bottle, a little solution that has 50 grams of glucose in it. And then one hour later, we're going to test her blood sugar. And if that blood sugar is greater than 140, she gets to do a three-hour test. Now, one question that I often get is, does she need to fast before the oral glucose tolerance test? And the answer is no. Now, if she needs to do a three hour, then the answer changes to yes. So if the blood sugar is greater than 140 in that one hour, we get to do a three hour. It's not done the same day. It would be scheduled for a different time. So the three hour blood sugar test, the glucose tolerance test, what happens is we are going to be fasting for at least eight hours prior to this test. When she gets to the lab, She'll have a fasting blood sugar checked. They will give her a solution that now has 100 milligrams of oral glucose. I can speak from experience and tell you that this is very, very sweet. Um, and then we start a timer. So then we will check a blood sugar at one hour after drinking the solution, two hours, and then at three hours. Okay. So you will get a diagnosis of gestational diabetes if the fasting blood sugar is greater than 95 or two of the other three lab values are high, okay? If two of the other three lab values are high, that will get you a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. All right, Mrs. Jones blood glucose with the one hour test is 123. Does she have gestational diabetes? What do we think? Mm 
I'm seeing a lot of yes. I'm seeing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yes. Excellent job. We are concerned. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk a little bit about gestational diabetes. What is it? Well, gestational diabetes mellitus, you might see it as GDM, gestational diabetes mellitus. This is diabetes that's diagnosed during pregnancy. So basically what happens is our pancreas isn't able to deal with that increased insulin requirements of pregnancy, okay? We have increased insulin resistance because of hormones that we have during pregnancy. We have that change in carb metabolism. So we can have gestational diabetes. This is generally a shock for women. Um, it's not something that they're super excited about because there are a lot of changes that they need to be concerned about. Now, one question that I get often is, what if someone has diabetes before they're pregnant? Are they still gonna do the glucose tolerance test? The answer is no, because we already know that they are diabetic. Now, just like any disease process, we wanna know what are the risk factors for gestational diabetes? Because there are some women that when they come in and we start looking at their health history, we're like, ooh, I'm, I'm a little nervous. It's possible that she might develop gestational diabetes. So what are those risk factors? Well, being overweight or obese is number one. If they're having a sedentary lifestyle, their idea of um, exercise is lifting their hand to change the channel not a whole lot of exercise in their life. They have a history of prediabetes. We see this in women with um, PCOS, which is also one of those risk factors or polycystic ovarian syndrome. If they have been diabetic in a previous pregnancy, they've had gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy that also increases their risk. If they have somebody in their immediate family who's diabetic, or they've had a baby in the past that was greater than nine pounds or 4.1 kilograms. We also have some ethnicities that have an increased risk. So black, Hispanic, American Indian, and Asian American ethnicities that also increases the risk. Now, what is this assessment gonna look like? Well, we just talked about some of this. We're gonna screen them for gestational diabetes with those glucose tolerance tests between 24 to 28 weeks. And we're also going to be screening their urine for glucose. Now, what could happen with someone with gestational diabetes? Well, there are a few different things. This can lead to bigger babies. We call that macrosomia, big babies, okay? So what's the problem with that? Well bigger babies can lead to more trauma. It can increase a risk of needing a C-section. It can also increase the risk of preeclampsia in the mother. And we can have a hypoglycemic baby. Interesting. So let's talk about that for just a second. So sometimes depending on the growth of these babies, they may get delivered a little bit earlier than we would like due to their size. We want to Obviously, deliver safely vaginally if possible, but sometimes we need to deliver a little bit earlier due to size and decreasing the risk. Other times, um, providers might talk about a scheduled C-section for that, for that very reason. If the gestational diabetes is left untreated, there is an increased risk of stillbirth. Okay, so let's talk about this hypoglycemia in babies for just a minute. So in utero, baby is used to the blood sugar being regulated by mom. So they're being thrown all the glucose and we're able to rid the body of it. Now, the thing is, once they are on their own, once they're delivered, the body is used to having high levels of glucose to deal with, right? Well, now there isn't those high levels of glucose, but we're still acting as if they are, which leads to hypoglycemia. So what are we gonna do? What, what type of management are we going to look at? Well, the first thing that we prefer is being able to manage things with diet and exercise. Diet and exercise, so watching those carbohydrates, 
checking blood sugars. Exercise is so important. It's important if you don't have gestational diabetes, but it's really important for a gestational diabetic mom. We're going to be monitoring blood glucose. So generally that looks like a fasting blood sugar and then one or two hours after each meal. We call those two hours postperandial. Generally, once the baby is delivered, mother should not require insulin. But like we just talked about, baby is at risk for hypoglycemia. Someone is saying dystocia. Yes, bigger babies have a higher risk of dystocia, getting those shoulders stuck. Now, what about for the baby? So we know, like we just talked about, the fetal pancreas is producing its own insulin, but it was used to those high levels of glucose in utero because of mom, right? So after delivery, we don't have those high levels of glucose, but we're still producing a lot of insulin and that can lead to hypoglycemia. Now, Mrs. Jones gets her blood glucose managed with insulin. Excellent. She said she finally feels better at this point, and she's going to see us at her next appointment in two weeks. Excellent. Mrs. Jones is doing all the things that she needs to do. She's taking care of herself. She's getting some exercise. Her blood sugars are being managed with that insulin. We have made it. So let me stop here and talk to you about our Sure Pass combo. This is my absolute favorite package that we have. So this has our on-demand videos. So we have videos on lots of different subjects. We have QBank questions. And this also gives you access to our three-day live review. If you've never attended a three-day live review, this is three days of information. We go through case studies. We talk through specialties. We talk through fundamentals. We do a mock NCLEX. You have the opportunity to interact with our, excuse me, our expert um, nurses, our expert tutors, one-on-one one -on -one as we go through the live review. So we have Q&A that's open where we're able to respond to you in real time. So if you're an RN, and you're interested in this package, I want you to scan the QR code on the left. If you are a LPN, I want you to scan the QR code on the right to check out more of what we have to offer. It has been my absolute pleasure getting to work with you today. I'm so glad that you were taking some time to join me on our free webinar Wednesday on maternity. So remember, at Archer Review, we're more than just test prep. We are dedicated to you. We are dedicated to our students, and we are cheering you on as you take on the NCLEX. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to working with you in the near future. Have a great afternoon, everyone.